Good morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan, and I am the Assistant Director here at Southampton History Museum. This morning, we're joined by Sinead Bullock, and she is a Shinnecock citizen and owner and operator of Mosquito Consulting. Um, Sinead and I have worked together over the last two, two and a half years or so on uh, various different programs, mostly our kayak programs in the summer. Um, if you haven't had a chance to join us on one of those trips yet, we should be hopefully running them again this summer, probably starting June-ish. Uh, so make sure to check out our website, southamptonhistory.org, uh, for tickets when those come up. But without any further ado, I'm going to throw everything to Shanae. And if anybody has any questions, I'll jump back in at the end to help answer and ask any questions you might have. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Well, Nadesawisa Kampanayu Mishunetu Uskwa, Wachi Shinnecock, Wachi Pamanaki, Wachi Siwanaki. My given name is Alid Kanu. I am Butterfly Woman, and I am so excited to share with you um, just a conversation about uh, food sovereignty. Um, so I actually am going to do this two different ways. I have a visual presentation, just pretty quick, just to kind of get into the, the how we got to bringing up food sovereignty today. And then I have some really awesome things here in person to be able to show you and talk to you about some of our, our foods here. So I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen and I will start the presentation. So once again, uh, my name is Shanae Bullock. I am the owner and CEO of Moxkitu Consulting which is a cultural and heritage preservation firm. It was founded in 2019. I've been doing a lot of this kind of work um, as far as cultural education um, and cultural consulting um, since I've really been able to walk in a way, right? Um, just been doing this kind of work um, and really stepping into the leadership aspect of it uh, right during my college years. Um, worked for a couple of different museums, um, is the Shinnecock uh, Museum, Mashantucket Pequot Museum, and Plymouth Plantation at the time. Um, so I am just, you know, I'm the owner of Moxie 2 Consulting. So that's just a little bit about me. I am a young professional, as most people would say, um, but I'm also a young CEO, um, business leader coming out of the Shinnecock Nation. Um, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Natui Usqua. That's how you spell that there. Um, that way you can just kind of follow some of the work that um, not only myself are doing, but just utilize, I utilize my platform as a resource to really help people understand uh, some of the things that they might be hearing or seeing um, throughout Indian country and the world when you're talking about indigenous peoples. Um, I think it's imperative before I start to talk about or just do a little bit of land acknowledgement some of the programs and things that you all might have been attending and, and doing throughout the last two years, land acknowledgement has been extremely significant. Um, I am actually not, I'm not calling in from the Piscataway homelands, but this is just an example. So if you were to go to www.naland.ca, you can actually type in where you're at and then it will tell you um, based upon the territories, languages, and treaties of where you're at. Um, I'm currently zooming in from the Muscogee Creek lands in Atlanta, Georgia, um, but I originate from the Shinnecock territory, which is where Southampton is currently located on. Um, so this is a great resource for all of you to be able to use um, in your, you know, in, in, in your everyday life, you know, as you're traveling, if you're going on vacation, and you want to know who are the people that are here, who are the people that are the original stewards of these lands that I'm visiting, um, this is how you search. And this is actually a platform that was created by Indigenous people. Where are we from? Shinnecock um, is one of the communities that uh, is a Algonquin coast coastal Algonquin language speaking community. Um, this isn't really do good justice of showing you, but if you all understand or anything about Long Island here uh, where my arrow is, this is exactly where um, the Shinnecock people where we still reside. Um, and the same thing with Montauk. The beautiful thing about all of these communities is we call ourselves sister tribes. We have been intermarrying, of course, thousands of years ago. We have lived here 
and these waters uh, actually weren't as as big as they are now. So the landmass was actually closer. So we had uh, ways to be able to really go back and forth, um, such as our canoe ways. We talk about that in our kayak tour. Um, and so all, all of us are essentially still living in these territories. We might've moved from one side to another side because we were kind of forced to do that. But essentially we are still living in these territories and holding and continuing our culture and today. Um, so I think it's important when we think about food sovereignty to think about our genetic relation to the land and the water. Our ancestors were semi-nomadic. We lived obviously in the, on the beautiful coastline, not exactly where you see these beautiful mansions that are living, um, that are built on our uh, shores today um, because we didn't believe in living directly on the beach because we know how powerful the water is. Um, but we lived, um, you know, towards the marshlands more so, um, and we were semi-nomadic. So come the wintertime, we moved inland to, at, at higher points, um, and that's how we lived. And so we had a genetic uh, relation to it because as the seasons changed, uh, we did too. We harvested with the seasons, and we ate and foraged with the seasons, our fishing and our shell traditions. Um, you know, we use carbon neutral um, vessels such as machines or canoes, if you will. Um, and when you harvest with the seasons, your body becomes acclimated with the environment in which is you are living in. Um, and the same thing with shell fishing, as well as fishing and hunting. Um, and so it is really through our inherent sovereignty that we have um, to be able to access food sovereignty or to assert food sovereignty. Um, and so today, unfortunately, the, the, the term food sovereignty really comes up a lot because there were laws made against our way of living. Um, you have, you know, just, just going down the list here, the Pequot massacre, that's a whole separate presentation, but that's pretty important to note, um, because out of the Pequot massacre, a lot of laws against us saying our own name, um, speaking our own language foraging in particular places. Um, all of these type of things really came out of some of these wars because there were laws that were made or executive orders, if you will, proclamations, resolutions, and legislation that were coming out of these um, townships as well as colonies um, in the New England and Long Island area. Um, and so with that, we were forced into slavery and indentured servitude. Uh, to help to build America, if you will. Um, and with that, we were being taken away from our inherent sovereign rights. Um, and then when people began to start speaking up or practicing these inherent sovereign rights as an indigenous person and demonstrating that in the court of law, paper genocide became a thing to say, well, you're not Indian, so you can't practice that um, based upon the color of our skin. The photo that you see here in the background is something, I love this photo um, for so many reasons. One, because it's my direct ancestors. Um, and, and, and I see um, the phenotype of my mom and in my relatives inside of um, the faces of my ancestors here. But it also has a way of proving that paper genocide existed since the 1800s, if you look at the very bottom, it says the last of the Shinnecock Indians, L-I-N-Y 1884. That is proof that <laughs> they said that this was the last of it. So if this was the last of it, then anybody going forward is not considered Shinnecock. And so if a Shinnecock person is foraging or practicing their inherent sovereign right, or even practicing food sovereignty in the court of law, the paper genocide wins, um, unfortunately. And so then you had something called the Indian Removal Act, of course, um, the Trail of Tears, boarding schools, um, foreign animals and plants, they brought diseases um, that actually started to eat up some of our foods and to extinction, as well as some of the feces that, that were uh, coming from some of these animals got into some of our clam beds and things like that and polluted some of the areas in which we fished or hunted in. Um, 
of course, having to sell and lease land. And some of these lands could have been hunting lands. They could have been lands that we may not have been quite living on, but we could be harvesting uh, for. Um, and the same thing with controlled burns. These controlled burns that we had actually helped to put nitrogen back into the soil in which we are going into places to forage. Um, and then the list goes on, you know, stop, I, I think I mentioned um, forced to stop speaking our languages. Um, in the town of Southampton, as a matter of fact, I believe at the Southampton History Museum, there are stocks that people put their, uh, were forced to put their heads and their arms, their hands in. Oh, those very stocks were used for my direct ancestors. Um, and if they were caught speaking their language, they were forced to be in those stocks for several days, sometimes weeks at a time. Um, some people uh, died short, quickly afterwards because of the lack of mal, uh, nutrition that they were receiving at that time. Um, and that is something that I think people should think that this didn't just happen in other parts of Indian country, but it happened right there in the town of Southampton. Um, and of course, when you stop speaking a language or you're forced to stop speaking a language, the oral history and the cultural knowledge and wisdom that comes through that language is stopped as well. And you're not able to pass that down. Um, same thing with hunting and fishing permits. Um, so when we talk about food sovereignty, these are some of the causes um, for us to fight for food sovereignty. Um, now we legally can do that today. Um, um, and by doing that, we put our lives on the line um, for everybody because clean water is really a sole source of food sovereignty there. You know, you have indigenous people manage to hold tenure over 25% of the world's land surface and support about 80% of the global biodiversity, all while making up less um, than 2.5% um, of the human population. We have a continued biocentric lifestyle that we still practice because those laws were made against our way of living at that time. A lot of that went underground um, and it was still currently happening, just not in the open. Now that some of those laws, some of them, not all of them have been rescinded, um, we can now publicly speak our language. We can now publicly share this wisdom. We can now publicly practice our culture and and forage and fish, but there are still limitations. There is still boundaries. There is still stolen land. There is still, um, you know, extinction or endangered species of foods uh, that we have and water that is still being polluted. And with that being said, we have a responsibility as indigenous people who hold tenure over the world's surface to protect this earth. Um, and fight for it. And so that's what we do. There's a photo here, as you can see, um, of myself and two others that we were at Standing Rock, really fighting for uh, the protection of the, uh, the land and the water there, because that when that water is polluted, specifically these rivers, it affects the rest of the world. And we understand that um, as we've been practicing these life ways for thousands of years. And so we have a continued biocentric lifestyle. Um, and again, um, you know, we have inherent uh, sovereignty. Um, it's important to think and to know that we still practice that and it's not for show all the time. This is just literally our everyday, you know, way of living. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes we have to become a little vocal to encourage others to stand with us, um, but also to practice these ways, go back into the forest and spend time with those, those botanics um, and the, the herbs and things like that. Um, because I always tell people, what happens when you are left abandoned, when you are not tended to, we can die. So the same thing can happen to some of our indigenous plants that are still growing and trying to grow um, in these areas that they've been growing in since they've been growing. Um, I actually just, just some resources here. Um, and this is also practicing my inherent sovereign right, right? Because Although one of those laws that you saw was, you know, stop speaking the language, stop practicing the culture. This is my way of kind of getting back to that. And I wrote a book called 50 Plant Medicines, Indigenous Oral History and Perspective. Here are some of the plants um, that I talk about in there. I'm gonna show you some of them today. 
um, but you can visit the website um, there and access the ebook. It's an ebook right now and it's only 10 bucks. Um, and of course, I over the, the course of the pandemic, um, I've forged uh, out there in Long Island with some of my relatives and other places here on the East Coast to prepare something called a Moxquito box. And in that box, you know, we have different herbs and, you know, um, information in there to help people understand a little bit better on how to help, you know, with, with our natural medicines. Um, and of course, I am from the Shinnecock Indian Nation, which is always sovereign, you know, and we've been sovereign and we are remaining that way. But we always have to somewhat still fight for our sovereignty. And that is something that, you know, well, the day comes that we don't have to fight it anymore is the day that earth is now restored. The balance here on, um, on earth is restored. So I actually would love to share with you all um, some of the things that I have here on my table. Um, one of my most favorite things I have on the table is this corn right here. This corn, I'll show you here, just giving a little close. This corn was gifted to me um, and the seeds that this corn has came from were also the very seeds that my Nipmuc relatives out in Western Massachusetts grew in the 1600s. Um, these seeds were found um, and re-gifted to the Nipmuc people to grow. And this was a gift that they given me. And I say this because this is food sovereignty. Um, because in so many ways by eating seeds and eating food that your ancestors have prayed over um, actually helps to heal your own DNA. It helps to heal so much of your, yourself, you know, um, and it also practices the food sovereignty and it brings back um, our ancestral wisdom and it brings back our ancestral ways and also the roots that grow from these seeds help to connect to some other places underneath the ground to some of the other plants and medicines that have been having a hard time growing because of the lack of nourishment under the ground. And so there's so many um, stories that can come out of just the corn itself. Um, one of my other favorites is staghorn sumac. Um, I have all these plants actually in my book also through oral history. Um, so staghorn sumac, um, these are amazing. I call these the uh, Indian emergent sea pack. Um, it is the Indian lemonade, if you will. It literally um, tastes like lemonade. Um, but if you take one of these little tiny little, little teeny little uh, furry little pellets, if you will, or pellets, and you pop it in your mouth, I know you can't try it, but it is a burst of vitamin C. One of these has almost like a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. Um, so when we make tea, it tastes like lemonade. And it's very, 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 very healthy for you. Um, I typically get them around like the fall um, because accessible to get. They're a little higher up in some of the, the trees that they have. Um, so you do got to do a little climbing or ask one of your relatives that's taller to grab it. And then what I usually do is I freeze them. Um, and when I freeze them, I can use them throughout the, um, I can use them throughout the, the winter time. Um, clay pots are exactly what I will put this in to boil. Um, you know, in these clay pots, I use this particular one outside in the fire, as you can see, it, it is functional, it's not just to be pretty. Um, but in here I have sassafras, sassafras, pieces of sassafras root um, in here. Um, I wish you could smell it because it smells like root beer. Um, sassafras, along with cannabis, <laughs> um, has been outlawed for use during the, um, the war on drugs um, because sassafras uh, was actually found to have strong medicinal properties. 
Um, sassafras is definitely something if you have a flu, if you have a cold, um, if you have a fever, all of those things, sassafras really helps to, um, you know, uh, fight your immune system. Um, and you boil it. Um, it's not something that you just boil for a short amount of time, like a regular tea bag. You actually have to kind of put this in a pot and let it boil for a couple of hours, you know, to really, really, really um, get those toxins out of it, but to also um, to, uh, to, to extract the, the medicine from the root itself. Um, and the reason why we use clay pots is because clay actually retains heat the best. Um, if you were to pour some water in here and put some herbs or something in here and let it, you know, um, cook over a fire and then the fire stops, this will stay hot all day long. Um, it's like your, your, your old Yeti, I would say this is like an old Yeti cup or America's first crock pot because we had some clay pots that were large. I mean, when I say large, um, I mean, you could put soup, you can put like a, a leg of deer or a whole fish in there and let it boil down. You know, um, our clay pots are very important to us. Um, just looking at my time here, I'm, I'm doing pretty good on time. Um, and then of course I have some mullein here. So this is mullein that I've dried out. Um, you know, I have it all dried out here. And mullein is actually something that grows like, most people say weeds. Mullen is something that I feel like a lot of people mow over with their lawns, uh, lawnmowers, and don't even realize it. But mullen can save your life. I have a couple of people that I have known that have used mullen to save their children's lives who have severe asthma. Um, it really gets into your lungs and it gets rid of all of the mucus. Um, in your respiratory um, system, it, it, it kills all that mucus off and it allows you to fully breathe. So it really does a deep cleanse. How do you use mullein? You can smoke it. Um, you can, um, you know, put it in a tea form. Um, you can also inhale it, you know, put it over a pot, put your, um, what do you call it? towel over your head and you can actually just inhale it and that actually really really helps in so many ways so if you're ever feeling like that just make sure that you know you don't go roll over the uh, the mullen but what does it look like right there is a real big description of it in my book there um but mullen grows really tall and has these beautiful yellow like every other year like it has these beautiful yellow like um stalk like flowers that grow on the top of it but they're super soft like bunny's ears and they can get super big i've seen mullen leaves the size of my arm or half of my arm then i've also seen mullen leaves the size of my nail because people don't allow them to grow um i was always taught to pick from the bottom you know and then therefore more will grow out that way and then it'll just you know it'll just keep growing so best time to really get them is towards like august time because sometime August, September, because sometimes like by the end of September, like they're dying, you know, um, a scooter squash, right? A scooter squash is the original word for squash. Um, I was with some people the other day and I was talking to them about, I said, Piawi Apashal, which means flower. Um, well, no, sunflower, <laughs> but I was saying Apashal and they were like, well, what, what is a shortened word for it? I'm like, there isn't a shortened word. It, it is what it is. That's exactly what the settlers did. They were like, well, we're not going to say a scooter squash. It's just a lot to say. We'll just say squash. You know what I mean? Like, we'll just say squash. Um, but I think it's important to know, as we talk about food sovereignty, we're able to speak the language of what some of our plants actually are, you know, and that brings so much to life, it brings the culture to life. But corn, bean, well, corn, I don't have any dried beans here. Corn, beans, and squash. Um, essentially, everybody knows it's the three sisters garden, and all of that, and it really is. Um, and there is a functionality that they have on many different levels, spiritually um, and physically, emotionally, and also mentally. 
Um, because all that's put into the growing of them. You know, when women actually went into the gardens, they adorn themselves. You know, I'm not into the garden today, but I wanted to make sure that I was pretty. You know, I have my wampum on, I have my cannabis ring on, and, you know, I put my lipstick on. We painted ourselves on a daily back in the day, right? You know, we painted ourselves like we paint ourselves today. And, but when you go into the garden and you beautify yourself, you, it's almost like you're going into church. You're going into creator's temple. And so to do that, you want to make sure you're, you're beautified, adorned with, with all of the medicines that you believe help you, you know, feel great about yourself. Because when you feel great and you put that energy into the growing of the plants, you and Mother Earth are working together because Mother Earth at the time of you putting your corn there and your beans and your squash, she's pregnant. And your job is to help nourish her through her pregnancy and to nurture her through her pregnancy so that what comes out of it is super healthy for us. And so that's why, you know, corn, beans, and squash can be looked at at a very spiritual level. But even on a scientific or physical level, the corn is planted uh, first. Um, and usually when the acorn leaves or like, you know, those little oak leaf, acorn leaves get to like the size of like a squirrel's ear, they start to bud out. That's when you know, okay, it's time to, you know, plant the, the corn. But that's the planting time. Prior to that, the herring and certain fish start to run and like, you know, bunkers and all these different kinds of fish start to run uh, from the rivers and down into our bay areas. And when that happens, that's when you know it's time to start fishing. And when you start to fish and you collect all those fish, the fishing weirs and our fishing nets, you gather a lot of that. And that's when you put it into your cornfields or your three sisters gardens to actually start fertilizing. And you want them to really decay. And once that really fertilizes the soil, by then that's when you're really gonna to start to see those acorn leaves get to the size of a squirrel's ear. And you plant your corn seeds. And when you plant your corn seeds, you build it on a mound because once it's on a mound and they start to grow up, when the, um, the corn leaves, not this, this is, this is the corn itself. When the corn stalk leaves get to the size of your like hand high out of the ground, then that's when you plant your beans and your, and your squash because now um, it's gonna grow out and it's gonna shade um, the areas so that the sun doesn't like a, a dry up all the water. So there is a way that they all help each other. The corn pulls a lot of nitrogen out of the soil and the beans put back in almost the same amount of nitrogen into that soil. So it's like a, they're sisters, they work together. Um, and that's, you know, that's just a little bit about the uh, Three Sisters Garden. But I just wanna thank you all for, um, for tuning in, uh, listening in, um, you know, and I really hope that you were able to gather something out of this. Um, I will put in the chat, uh, my website here, which is www.mosquitoconsulting.com. Um, and if there's ever any, you know, um, needs or uh, however I can be a resource or uh, anything like that, um, definitely do not hesitate to reach out. Um, and I want to thank the Southampton uh, History Museum for once again, uh, reaching out to me to be able to share our um, cultural knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much. Turning it over to you, Connor. Great, thank you so much. Um, maybe a bad choice on my part, not eating lunch beforehand. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking as we were, as the program is going on that this would be a great one to redo um, at some point in the future where we could actually maybe try some of the stuff in person. Um, might be a great, great time. Um, but let's see, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to submit them in either the Q&A function or in the chat, and we'll go through and ask any questions that may come up. Um, oh, someone said about ground nuts. Yeah, yeah, so was, that's the first one I was going to ask. Um, you know, so interestingly enough, uh, there, I would like to say that, believe it or not, there are still a lot of indigenous nuts 
ground nuts and even beans and wild uh, foods that are still growing that we haven't really been able to see in a long time. And because of the pandemic, everybody had time to get out in their yards and to push back everything and to, you know, um, like I think uh, even some of the, the, the city had to start, you know, city and towns, municipalities had to start, um, you know, clearing out and, and really managing some of the areas that people are in these public lands spending time. And out of there, out of nowhere, you're starting to see things come back because for a while, if it wasn't managed or taken care of, you're starting to see it. Um, which was cool. I actually, I won't, I don't know if it was ground nuts, but there was some sort of bean that were growing in an area that we would have never thought that they were growing in. And it's because of just that, the pushing back, you know, um, but ground nuts, they're definitely high in protein. Um, you know, I haven't been, I have never foraged ground nuts um, because I'm not really sure where they are growing in my homelands. Um, but I do know that they're extremely high in protein and they were definitely something that we've always collected, even from our nut bearing trees, um, black walnut, hickory, um, you know, we actually used to put baskets and mats in the forest and just allow things to just fall as opposed to climbing up the tree and get it. And then, you know, just go in and grab your basket that's full of nuts or just put all the ones that might have not have fell and then go back to the village basically. Well, is um, there so I have somebody else asking, uh, is there a difference between saghorn sumac and the sumac that I see by the road? Okay, yeah. So apparently um, there are two different, I forgot what it's called. So the staghorn sumac is like a red. There is some that's by the road that has like a fuchsia look to it. And it looks more like velvet. That's not the same kind of um, sumac. I don't know exactly what the word is for that, but it's not the same kind. Um, staghorn sumac is definitely different than that. Um, but this is definitely not poisonous. I will say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And is that the staghorn grows here locally in Southampton or? Yeah. Um, you know, the place that I see that has the most, I mean, cause I'm always looking around, um, right at Westgate Road where you, where Shinnecock is, where our museum is, uh, there's Tidewater there on Montauk Highway, across the street, like right before you get to the college, across the street from the res, there is a lot of staghorn sumac and they typically always grow by the sides of the road. Um, yeah. It, come to think of it, I do, I drive home that direction all, like, every day, and I, now that you're talking about it, I recognize seeing that a lot. Yeah, it, it's, it's very bulky there. I mean, the thing about it is, uh, I don't see that much. There is some on our tribal reservation or homelands that I do see, um, but it's not everywhere, and it's hard mm -hmm. sometimes because you have to pull over on the side of the road, and da, 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 but totally worth it for the winter time, you know? Is there um is there like an idea or an initiative maybe to maybe start planting more of these types of indigenous plants that you used, used to be able to forage for but maybe now you can't forage for because of you know various things that have happened. You know um yes I know that uh, the Southampton Conservation Committee um, my cousin uh, she is the first Shinnecock to ever sit on that board. I know that they definitely do a, an assessment of what is endangered, what is not, and especially when there's all this development and stuff happening, you know, whether they're private homelands or whatnot. Um, and so there's definitely initiatives out there, even on the Shinnecock side, to really assess what we have, what's endangered, what's, you know, almost ne really near extinct, um, and then how do we reintroduce it back? Because a lot of the reintroduction can still clash with invasive plants. Yeah. Um, so it's really good to sit down with our environmentalists. Um, even we have tribal environmentalists too, you know, that understand those things. But I always just tell people like, you know, I paddle, you know that. And so like bulrush, bulrush is a plant that we don't see that much of. Cattail reeds is something that we don't see that much of, but we see a ton of fragmity plants, you know, um, same thing with su sweet grass that we don't really see a lot of that. And so how do we reintroduce that back? 
really just getting the seeds from them and just putting them in some of the areas that you know that they will thrive in and just check on it, you know? Yeah. Um, let's see if anybody else has any questions. Um, please feel free to submit them. If uh, you think of something later, you can always email um, and we'll see about getting those questions answered for you. But I mean, I just want to say thank you uh, for, for joining us, doing this program with us. Um, is there any more information people could get from you? I know you mentioned your book. I don't know if there's anything else. People, where could they find said book if they wanted to get it? Yeah. Um, so again, you can go to my website. The book is on there. I do have like a really awesome, um, you know, medicine box that has at least the different herbs in there. I have some elderberries. I have burdock root. I have a lot of different um, herbs in there um, and some resource, some reading material. Um, again, follow me on Instagram. Um, and, you know, I say, I don't know where everybody's calling in from, but, you know, use that resource of www.native-land.ca. Therefore, anywhere you go, you can learn where are the native peoples or who are the native peoples of where you're living or visiting um, and get to see what kind of resources that they might have. You know what I mean? Um, because, or call to actions, they might be fighting for food sovereignty or fishing rights or something like that. And, you know, um, there might be something that you can learn from or, or be a resource to. Yeah. Oh, I see someone here asking uh, to repeat uh, the website for the native land. I'm going to pull it up on the screen to show, and it is uh, native-land.ca. Mm -hmm. um, and when you go to it, it basically kind of just looks like Google Maps, um, mm -hmm. but you can scroll in on um, all the different areas in they mostly have North and South America um, and a little bit in Africa and Australia, New Zealand are, are very heavily uh, populated as well. Yeah, um, if you just type in, if you just type in the search anywhere you want to go or type, it'll it'll zoom you right into that area. Yeah, so for instance, if I put in uh, the address for the museum right here, it'll zip us right into Southampton Village and very you clearly you're on Pinnacock <laughs> land here. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I love that website. It's it's really helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Like, and then the cool thing you go out to, if you're going into the Caribbean for a vacation and you want to know, right? <laughs> exactly. You can go check around and see, because a lot of people might know of the bigger tribes from certain areas. Yeah. Like, everybody's heard of the Apache or the Cherokee and things like that. But if you go to these areas where those bigger tribes might have been from, you could go in and find out about the lo a lot of the smaller, more local tribes that might have been there or still around um, mm -hmm. and be able to educate yourself when you go out for traveling. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. Wonderful resource. Uh, someone's saying, how would they like to plant indigenous? How do I find the seeds stock? Um, so indigenous plants, that's great. Um, I think if there are specific indigenous plants that you'd like to plant, I think it's good to know what's already in your yard. So one of the things I didn't talk about is the invasive plants that came over had a very similar energy like the colonists. They took over <laughs> um, and they, they genocided other plants. So sometimes indigenous plants might not thrive in a certain area that you might want to bring them back because of the, you know, the takeover from other um, uh, invasive plants. So I think it's good, like an assessment of what's there, um, how strong are some of these indigenous plants that you might want to um, bring back? Do they, do they need to be maybe secluded, um, you know, or do maybe you need to put them in a pot and then just kind of like let them grow there and let them become stronger and then plant them? Um, I think, you know, because we don't want to experiment um, because I've seen, I've seen, um, I've worked at the Brooklyn, not worked, I had a partnership with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden recently, and um, we talked about 15 plants that we wanted to talk about. One of them was sweetgrass. Um, and so I was like, we walked the garden, all of the other plants they had there, sweetgrass, they said that every time they've tried to bring it there, it just doesn't thrive. 
Well, it's probably because sweetgrass grows in wetlands and Brooklyn is like, Brooklyn not is that. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, so they need that uh, humidity. They need all of that uh, to really thrive. Um, although they have different places that they have curated to kind of mock that, it's not exactly that. So that might be a reason why it didn't thrive there, but it is an indigenous plant to the Northeast, you know? So just, I think maybe doing a little bit of research and then how do you obtain the seeds? Well, um, one, know where and when those seeds can be retrieved in the wild or look up indigenous Native American um, seed banks because there are some Native people, we have access to that and we still trade seeds. Like we, that was a part of our trade, seeds. Yeah, and uh, if you find yourself having difficulty doing a lot of that, there's a lot, I mean, especially out here, there's a lot of great landscape uh, design firms and landscapers and, the, and themselves that can help you figure out what's on your property. And then we can go from there afterwards trying to find your indigenous seeds to, to bring in. Because I know if I went in my yard, I know there's bushes. I'm not right. sure what, anything else beyond that. Um, so, uh, but yeah, but this, this has all been fantastic. Um, it's been a really great resource having you uh, help us here at the Southampton History Museum with a lot of our programs. Um, I would encourage everybody, if you do have any questions, to visit uh, Sinead's website, mosquitoconsulting.com. I believe you put it in the uh, chat earlier. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out via email. And um, without any further ado, uh, thank you again, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.